Hello there and welcome to another J&J Tabletop video. My name is Jake and I ran Dragons of Stormwreck Isle, specifically the Seagrow Caves adventure. I, I ran the whole thing, but you know, the video that you clicked on, that's what it's about. So <laughs> basically when I ran it, I actually feel like this was my most fun part of the adventure, or at least the one that I feel like I did the best job on. And I want to take what I've learned and give it to you to help make your journey on this adventure as Dungeon Master as smooth as possible. So, I mean, yeah, spoiler alert. So if you're going to be a player, I'm not going to tell you not to watch the video, but you will have a very different experience if you know what to expect ahead of time. So let's do the whole J&J do-do-do, do-do-do thing, and uh, then we'll get started. Let's start things off by giving you an overview of what the adventure is. Basically, a group of myconids or mushroom people live on Stormwreck Isle, and Tarek, which is an NPC that we talked about in the first two videos of this series, is somebody that made friends with these myconids, and he brings them food scraps, and they give him cool fungi that he can use to make potions and all sorts of alchemical things that a botanist and, you know, alchemist does. That's just kind of how it goes and he's basically concerned because there's this big fungal octopus that's now blocking the path to get there and he can't talk to his friends so he asks the group to help out now the reason why this octopus is blocking the entrance is that Senensa the leader of the Myconids has taken ill because there is a blight that seems to have just permeated throughout these caves and many Myconids are sick and dying and so Senensa needed some way to protect her people, and that's why the octopus is there. The adventure actually doesn't tell you where the octopus came from, but it's there, and Sinensa put it there, <laughs> so you can handle that however you want. Uh, my players didn't seem to care, and I'm kind of happy about it, but I think by Mykonid lore, she probably found a dead octopus, did the little Mykonid thing, and it sort of reanimates them. If you played Baldur's Gate 3, you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, I guess that's a little bit of a spoiler alert, but that cat's out of the bag. <laughs> but if you remember from the lore of the Stormwreck Isle adventure is that one of the red dragons that was here, Sharuth, that died and is entombed underneath the water, kind of formed certain volcanic activity, which had these noxious fumes that would just sort of seep up into the caves, but normally would vent through and everybody would be fine. Well, there's like a fire crystal sort of thing that sort of like grew in the cracks of the vents and so the ventilation can't let the air escape because it's blocked and that's the source of the sickness and uh that's really the goal of the adventure is to be able to help the myconids and so we're going to go into how you can do that we're going to talk about uh how the myconids kind of are and some of the role play there because i think the book does one of the most classic mistakes that you're really not supposed to do as a dungeon master but we'll talk about that a little bit later. The features of this area or in the Seagrow Caves themselves are pretty straightforward. There's some fun descriptive things and definitely familiarize yourself with them. But most importantly, the fumes, like the, to the toxic volcanic fumes that I just talked about, they actually affect the group if they decide to take a long rest in the caves. If they actually do that, they need to make a constitution saving throw, a DC 13, which... It's not intent, like terribly bad or difficult, but it's also not a cakewalk, especially if you're not proficient in them at, at this level. But uh, yeah, if they fail that, they're poisoned for the rest of the day. That's kind of a big deal. It didn't come up in our playthrough. I'm guessing it won't come up in yours, but you never know what players are going to do. So that's something that you need to be mindful of should that event happen. All right, now let's talk about how the group gets to the caves. Now they can walk if they like, or they could take a boat. The module does give instructions for both. It also gives instructions about like if they get there at low tide or high tide and things like that. And I see no reason why you can't use those rules if you think that would be fun. I kind of just made it easy and said it was low tide because I, I don't know, it did for me when I looked at it, it didn't seem to add anything to the adventure by making them manage something that eventually they're just gonna get through. But if that's something you wanna do because you think it'll be fun, I see no reason not to use it. And when the group gets there, they are going to encounter the Spore Servant Octopus, which is a fun little encounter. I don't think you have to make it super epic. 
I do, if you watch the first part of this uh, series, I do recommend that the group just be at level two for both chapters two and three. And this is a pretty decent reason why. Like, I mean, it's not the most difficult thing in the world to fight. It's got 52 hit points, so it's beefy, but it's got an armor class of 11, so that's not so bad. But it's just one of those things that if it is able to, like, get the jump on them, which I did do a stealth check kind of situation, I thought that would be fun. Uh, it could it could get a few hits in, I think, before the group takes it down, because like I said, 52 hit points, that's, that's pretty beefy, especially at levels one or two. Your damage output really doesn't change that much there. So uh, I think the extra tankiness that a group is going to have at level two will be better able to handle this and maybe not feel the pressure to rest later on and encounter some of those features that I just talked about. So that's something you can weigh. Either way, I think it's going to work just fine. But again, my recommendation was level two, and I think you'll be just fine here. And, and the, the encounter kind of runs itself. Before we move on to talk about the Myconids, I just want to mention that this adventure does recommend throwing in some Sturges if you're level two. And I'm kind of notorious for just ignoring Sturges because they're annoying. I didn't use Sturges. And actually, at the time of this video, it's been almost a year since we ran it. I actually don't remember. I may have given the Spore Octopus a second attack, but I just made sure that it wouldn't hit the same one twice unless that was the only available target, something like that. <laughs> Either way, you're going to have some fun with this one, and I would love to know how you run this fight or what you're thinking about when you run this fight in the comment section below. Okay, on to the Myconids. So the Myconids are just this very interesting species. They're, they don't communicate like how I'm talking to you right now, just like vocally or verbally. I guess both work. But well, the way they do it is it's actually telepathic and they use something, and if you look at the features of the Myconids, something called rapport spores. And it's just this like mushroom cloud dust spores that just kind of are around the air that just carry their thoughts to each other. And I actually really love the way that this module kind of presents that. And it offers the opportunity for you to just get your players to imagine how suddenly having a telepathic link with their fellow adventurers might affect them. I think I presented it some way like it doesn't mean that every thought you have you have to broadcast, but I'll leave it up to you to just determine how you think that this new mode of communication that's available might affect the way you do things. And my players had a lot of fun with it. I think they uh, they ran with it and it kind of let them let certain things slip and storytelling telling elements that say like one character had about their background that the others didn't know about it was a lot of fun to get them to kind of just drop hints and honestly they were fantastic if you haven't watched their playthrough i would highly recommend it because i think not only is it just fun and entertaining i think it'll probably help you get an idea for how things might work but the rapport spores and the way that this module handles that to me a plus i love how they did that now, in regards to the attitude that the Myconids have towards the group when they get there, if you look in the Dungeon Master's Guide and in the basic rules, which I'm going to put a link in the description, maybe even the pinned comments so that you can follow along, but they start off with an attitude of hostile towards the group. And I think when you read that in the module, you might think like, oh, they're hostile. That means as soon as they see the group, they're going to attack. And that's not the case. That means they're probably much more easily provoked to doing that and that kind of a thing. But I think that's a very good lesson for new dungeon masters and game masters that are looking to just add a sense of realism to their games to learn that just because someone's hostile doesn't mean they, they immediately go to physical violence. If you watch movies like Mean Girls or you basically have had any life experience whatsoever, you know that there's many different ways in which you can carry out that hostility towards somebody else or some group. And I think um, there's a lot of times if, a, if an organization values life, their own morality and ethics might come into play with how they handle hostility, intelligence. There's a lot of factors that goes into the decision to attack that it's not just as simple as, oh, they're hostile, they fight. But what this does do is it does set up what I alluded to earlier in the video when I said that it kind of locks progression to a persuasion check and basically just a roll of the dice. This thing, this d20, 
this can be fickle and it doesn't always work out the way you kind of want it to or hope it will or expect it to. And so I'm going to help you with that. But one thing that the Mykonids do immediately is they do warn the group like, hey, listen, just just get out of here. And the reason why they do that is because they've got a lot going on. Their leader is sick. They've got a lot of sick people. And so it kind of makes sense that they're very defensive, very protective right now. So the, the module says that to convince a Mykonid that's hostile to, you know, converse or to allow the characters to continue into the cave, you have to pass a DC 20 charisma check. And whether they're trying persuasion, intimidation, deception, doesn't matter. They set the DC at 20, which is pretty difficult. And unless you're a rogue with a high charisma and proficiency and or expertise, really, you, at most, you're kind of expecting a plus five modifier, which means you got to roll 15 or higher just to do this thing. And if you mention Tarek, they say give advantage on the check. So honestly, that's kind of if you have a good like established party face, which my group actually didn't. Uh, you're, you're kind of looking at maybe sort of a 50-50 chance at progressing this adventure just due to a roll of the dice. And I don't think that's a good plan. So I've, I've got a couple ideas on that for you. Let's talk about mentioning Tarek's name. Obviously, the Mykonids know who Tarek is and that Tarek has a tendency to bring goodies to the Mykonids because that's just the system that they've established. So to me, if you mention Tarek and you say, hey, I got I got the goodies that he always brings. He wanted us to check in on you and was scared about the octopus, that kind of a thing. I personally think auto success. They're no longer hostile. Yes, I know they just killed the Guardian, but they, they, you're the messengers of Tarek. I think that's totally fine and acceptable to do. Now, some groups now, depending on whether they <laughs> whether they're trying to be deceptive or whatever the goals they have. Maybe they're not just going with the typical idea that they're there to help the Mykonids. Some groups might not want to mention Tarek's name. Maybe the rogue who uh, has the background of being in the Guild of Gallows thinks like, I don't trust Tarek. And I think if we present ourselves as allies, that might be bad for the future. Who knows what reasoning they may come up with. However, if they don't mention Tarek, maybe one of the Mykonids comes up and uh, through the telepathic spores will mention that they're sick, giving the group an opportunity. If there's a healer in the group, whether they're good with medicine checks or a cleric or a bard, a druid, somebody that can have access to healing, maybe they can kind of step in and say, hey, you know what? We can we might be able to help. That's another path that doesn't rely on a roll of the dice to succeed in changing that attitude that I think you should allow to work. It's a good fallback option because at this point, you have to know that the group doesn't know that there's a sickness in the caves. The only thing they know is that there's something going on there. So that's a good fallback option, uh, especially if you think they're struggling with how to proceed. And especially if they try to talk their way in and the, the check fails, you can at least have something to work with. And if all else fails, the group doesn't want to talk about Tarek, doesn't want to present the bag of goodies. Uh, they fail the, the, the social check that we just talked about. Maybe there isn't even a healer in the group. There's no cleric to even offer services. Perhaps one of the Mykonids can either like smell or spot the bag of goodies in some way and uh, say, hey, wait a second. Do you, you know, you know, Tarek? Because he often brings something like that. And, you know, is that... Do you, do you know Tarek? You know, because locking locking the progress of an adventure behind a successful skill check is like DMing 101. You don't do that. And so I'm really confused as to why this was here in this adventure that's designed to help beginners. I don't know. That's a real head scratcher for me. But hopefully now after watching this video, you at least have some ideas. And if you have more ideas on how you could better make this situation. I'd love to hear them in the comment section because I think that's a good resource for anybody that's gonna run the adventure to be able to learn together. Now let's talk about section B to the fungus farm, which I love alliteration, so that's just fun. Basically, it's another encounter right away after the spore octopus because there's violet fungi, which uh, you got a couple of myconid sprouts, a couple of youths, and a couple of Mykonid adults working the farm here. And the adventure module says that they are completely oblivious to the existence of the violet 
fungi, which I find to be just weird. This is this is a farm that they work. This is where they get their food, and they don't know it very well. So the way I kind of worked with that is that I just said that they the the violet fungi are hostile towards non myconids, and that's just the way I I ran it. And I like that because it in our playthrough it kind of allowed the group to encounter something in front of the myconids not be a threat towards the myconids, specifically their children who I put out in front who were kind of just doing their thing when this happened and they ran away. And I think it was just kind of another way in which the group could show, because, you know, actions do speak louder than words, kind of show the myconids that they're not hostile. And this is something that we can work with. And, you know, we're here for a good reason. It's not just like, oh, we're raiding the myconid village. But honestly, the whole tone of this really kind of came off to me as more like this is just too much combat so i kind of ran it more like a trap like one of my players said that they walked over to like a wall to like just like lean on i forget exactly what he did but i look i ran it more like a trap like there was just one of them that went after him there and that's just kind of how i did it but if you are looking to try and force the group into a long rest decision in some way shape or form and i think you could do that either way i didn't see the point of it it just this encounter to me didn't add to the story, so I really didn't do too much with it. But if you want to, I think the module gives you know some good box text and good instructions on how to run it. I think it'll be just fine, and and you you could go from there. But again, I didn't lean into it too much, and I I had a lot of fun with it. But you do you. One nice thing that the module does do is it has a little section on the blighted fungi in which a character that is interested in looking at, you know, the different fungus around can detect that there is something going on here. Some, there's de there's decay. It, something's off. And it also mentions that there's no obvious source, which is also a nice non-specific mystery additive that you can throw into your adventure. So I like that section there. My group didn't inspect it, but some groups might. Sections B3 through B5, uh, really, it's just where the myconids live. You have a larder, which has sturges. Again, you got more. Some people, some people say, like, it's an attack on player resources or it's attacks on player resources, which kind of, I don't know. There's something about it I just didn't like. I, it, I felt like it would have taken the air out. Anyways, there's a larder. There's, like, a circle chamber where people or myconid people are sick and being attended to, and then you have... Sinensis in her sanctum where uh, this, she's just very she's actually considered a large creature. She's the leader and there's a, a couple of attendants really trying to make sure that she survives. And I think as long as you showcase that it's very sad and that it's starting to look grim, I think that's going to just help set the tone for the urgency in figuring out the mystery and eventually hope that the players decide to go to Section B6, the Crystal Cave. And speaking of the Crystal Cave, this is where the source of the sickness is. And it's because a fire crystal has formed in the cracks of the ventilation, kind of like we talked about earlier. And the way I envision this, I used to work in a restaurant and it kind of looked at it as like a grease trap that just eventually kind of solidified and kind of in a way seems to have grown in the pipes or like the, the way that the air could escape. And that's where this crystalline kind of just lives. And it just, it, that's how it works. And so that's, that's what's causing the blockage and that's why everybody's sick. I actually think that the boxed text does a very good job setting the tone with like very thick black smoke just filling the area and it kind of makes it very difficult to see and that sort of a thing. And that there's a couple of fume drakes, which I think are a very fun creature to add to your game, live here and uh, they're just lurking because there's like all these like tears between the like elemental plane of fire that these creatures kind of just like show up and do things. Um, you could have little sparks, maybe things like that, like lights flashing. Uh, but these two fume drakes, they're going to attack. And they have some like steam breath, I think it is. And it's uh, it, it's just a fun little encounter that kind of sets the tone that there's some danger here and kind of uh, it's definitely that bait to try and get maybe your spellcasters to use some of their bigger spells now or maybe like your fighter's going to use an action surge, that sort of a thing. Uh, but I, I like the way they set the tone here right away. After the initial fume drakes are defeated, the group is going to then encounter this fire crystal that's kind of formed in the cracks. 
And uh, really, it kind of only offers the solution of like, you know, hitting it, hitting the fire crystal will break it open. And then an obsidian egg, which contains a fire snake, will uh, land on the ground and it'll hatch and you, you have another encounter on your hands. But uh, the fire crystal itself, my group didn't want to just like break the crystal. I think if you watch our playthrough in this situation, I there's a couple of things. In my mind, like I had described earlier, I envisioned that the cracks kind of, this stuff grew in the cracks and that's why the vent was blocked. Uh, but what it did was, is in my mind, made it seem like, like you're not just gonna be able to like wrestle it free. Like it, it's kind of grown in the cracks of it. Like you can't just pull that out. That seemed to be what they wanted to do. And I know uh, I, you could ask them and maybe if uh, Josh, Nooch, Michael or Ricky, if you're watching this, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this in the comment section. I started to feel like I was saying no a little bit too much, like I couldn't roll with their ideas. And I think that could have been my own just imagining of what I saw it. But I also sometimes think that telling your players no has value. And this is maybe just a, a, an extraneous lesson here, but there are some things that there's kind of only one way to work it and creativity is great and if you can think of that a situation that the way you Im imagine this fire crystal being wedged in there working then roll with that but that's where i was when i saw this and so the ideas that they presented i was like i just don't see that working i don't like i, I wanted to say yes but um it, it, it felt a little railroady in that way but Sometimes that's just how life is. I don't know. I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts on that and, and how you might approach that in, in the comment section below, but that's how it worked for us. Now, the fire snake fight itself was uh, actually, I think, probably what I would consider to be the most tense moment in the campaign for our playthrough, and that's because I, I kind of ran things the wrong way. I, I actually, I believe because I ran them at level two, I was supposed to have three fume drakes in there initially. And uh, then you're supposed to add two if they're level two characters fighting the fire snake. I forgot to add a third one, just, just literally just forgot to add a third one when they first got in there. So I added a third one in this one. So they were fighting a fire snake and three fume drakes, which is a pretty intense fight <laughs> the way the way that they actually, the group approached the situation is basically everybody hid, but the barbarian went up there and cracked this thing and everybody did well in their stealth checks. So all of them were attacking the barbarian in that first round, uh, which actually was like, oh, 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 we got some real trouble here. Uh, but again, you, you should watch that. It, it was a lot of fun and uh, you can kind of run that however you want to. But I think if you're going by the book, if they're level one, you've got two fume drakes at first and when one fire snake or if you're level two, you have three fume drakes at first and then a fire snake and two fume drakes for the second part. But I had three at the second part with the fire snake and uh, it worked out fine. It was fun. I, it was actually to me the most fun encounter because of the, the tension there. But you could do that this way too. And I'm sure it'll be just fine. One thing of note is that when the group does break the fire crystal and now there's ventilation, it's supposed to let some light in and now all of a sudden you got all this shimmering light, which Mike and it's, they don't like the light. They're, they're dark dwelling creatures. And so the module then says that that explains why they, the Mike and it's tend to not go in this cave. Uh, the interesting part about that though, is that <laughs> when they get there, it's dark because of the smoke. So you'd think some Mike and it's might, go in there when there's some trouble there's there's just there's just a handful of things like that with this adventure that just kind of don't make sense i don't remember my group really caring too much about this little fact but i'd love to hear some ideas about how that should work in the comment section below uh, maybe they're just scared of it in general and they don't understand what's happening and maybe they think it's like a sickness cloud forming i don't know it could be something like that i think might work out but the module does mention that, so I figured I would in this video. Now let's talk about wrapping things up. After the crystal is destroyed and the ventilation is now clear, uh, the next morning, or after, you know, after a long rest, Sinensa does wake up. You know, my group, they went right to her just to see what's going on, and I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think I had her, like, move her hand onto another character's hand. Something like that to just signify that maybe 
something turned a corner just to give them a little hope. And I do believe that they they stayed the night and everything worked out just fine, which this if they do all of this and, and the crystals destroyed that whole poison constitution saving throw thing on a long rest that doesn't apply anymore. And uh, actually, Sinenti gives them like a ruby moral kind of a thing, which is something that the, uh, the attendants were using to try and help nurse her back to health that Tarek is going to be able to make into an elixir of health kind of as another reward for doing this adventure, which actually kind of doesn't really come into play now that I think about it in the adventure. So I, I can see giving them something else or having it do something else, even if it's just healing potions that, that Tarek can make. Something like that I think would be nice. Uh, but yeah, once the group went back and, and our playthrough, uh, our, our rogue played by Ricky Domingo, he got to have it out with Tarek a little bit that kind of brought that storyline to a head, which is a nice a nice thing to do, I think. So you could have some role play heavy moments there. We did, and I enjoyed it a lot. But I think at this point, really, this adventure wraps up kind of nicely. And uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on it, what what you might want to try and do with this adventure or what you might see as a concern and just hear how your playthrough is going in general. So let us know in the comments below. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and uh, tell us about your games. We love it. We also got some videos on screen now that might help you out with the rest of the adventure. Take care, everyone.